Asterix the Gladiator. It was the year 50 BC. After a long struggle, the Gauls had been conquered by the invading legions of the mighty Roman army, and famous chiefs like Vercingetorix had to lay their arms at Caesar's feet. Ancient Gaul, the country we now know as France, was entirely occupied by the Romans. Entirely? Well, not quite. Because in the province of Armorica, now Brittany, one small village of indomitable Gauls still held out against the invaders, a small village surrounded by fortified Roman camps. And back in Rome, the great conqueror Julius Caesar felt baffled. He was determined to bring that one little village under the rule of the Roman Empire, along with the rest of ancient Gaul. But how could he do it? More and more legionaries were sent to reinforce the fortified camps of Totorum, Aquarium, Laudanum, and Compendium. More and more legionaries discovered that rumours going around the Roman army to the effect that the Gauls, who lived in this little village, had superhuman strength, were perfectly true. Apparently, a single villager, however weedy he might look, could knock out a whole patrol of beefy Roman soldiers and stroll away humming cheerfully on his way to pick off a few wild boar in the forest for dinner. By Jupiter, Caesar said to himself frequently, there must be some secret behind the superhuman strength of those Gauls. There was. Indeed, there were two secrets. One, of course, was the native courage and resourcefulness of the Gauls, led by vital statistics, the chief of the tribe, who was majestic, brave, hot-tempered, respected by his men and feared by his enemies. Vital statistics himself had only one fear. He was afraid the sky might fall on his head tomorrow. But, as he brightly pointed out, tomorrow never comes, so there was nothing much for him or his brave men to worry about. Bravest of them all was the famous Asterix, hero of many adventures. A shrewd, cunning little warrior, all perilous missions were immediately entrusted to him and to his great friend Obelix, a menhir delivery man by trade. Menhirs, huge standing stones, which you can still see on some prehistoric sites, are heavy to carry, but Obelix, who was twice Asterix's size, made up in brawn for anything he lacked in brain. Although, as he was ready to assure anyone on the slightest provocation, he wasn't fat, just nicely covered. And he was always ready to set off on a new adventure with Asterix, so long as there was wild boar to eat and plenty of fighting. But the villager's other secret was the magic potion brewed by Getafix, the venerable village druid. The origin of the recipe for this potion was lost in the mist of time, and the secret recipe itself had been handed down from druid to druid by word of mouth. All Getafix would reveal was that there was mistletoe and lobster in it. The lobster was optional, but it did improve the flavour. The magic potion gave anyone who drank it superhuman strength for a limited period of time. After a while, the effects would wear off, but until then, a gall who had taken a dose of it was invincible. So whenever danger threatened, Getafix would brew up a big cauldron full and dole out a portion of potion to everyone. Or rather, nearly everyone. Obelix, for reasons to be revealed later, never got a helping at all which he thought most unfair. However, that left more for the other villagers, among whom we must also mention Cacophonix, the bard. Opinion in the village was divided as to his musical gifts. Cacophonix thought he was a genius. Everyone else thought him unspeakable. But so long as he didn't speak, let alone sing, everybody liked him. And Cacophonix was to play an important part in the story you're about to hear. At the beginning of our story, the Roman camp of Compendium was in a ferment. Odius Asparagus, prefect of Gaul and thus a very important person, was paying a call on centurion Gracchus' army surplus, commanding the garrison of the fortified camp. The prefect's galley had put in at the nearby coast, and four slaves carried him in a litter to the gates of Compendium, where centurion army surplus met him in person. Ave, prefect, said army surplus. This is a great honour for me. Ave Centurion, you're telling me, said Odius Asparagus briskly, heaving his considerable toga-clad bulk out of the litter. And now, he added, as they strolled to the Centurion's tent, 
Let me come straight to the purpose of my visit. I'm going to Rome on leave, and custom decrees that I take Caesar a handsome present, something unusual and very valuable. Settling his distinguished visitor in the most comfortable chair, the centurion nodded, and wondered a little apprehensively what was coming next. I did think, Odious Asparagus went on, of taking him a present from Lutetia. Lutetia was the old name for the capital city of Paris. Uh, a marble memo tablet, maybe, for him to carve down his appointments. But no, I thought that's too ordinary. And then, he said dramatically, then I had a brilliant idea. You did? said Centurion Army Surplus. I did, said the prefect. Why not, I said to myself, why not take Caesar a present of one of the invincible Gauls from these parts? What? yelped Centurion Army Surplus who could see so many reasons why not, that he was deprived of coherent speech for some little while. Um, um, ah, ah, um, he added, when he was feeling a little better. I it's like this, you see, Prefect, about these invincible Gauls. There's just one snag. Well, come on, then, what is it? inquired Odious Asparagus, draining his cup of wine. Well, they happen, Army Surplus pointed out, to be invincible. Precisely, said Odious Asparagus. Exactly. That's just what makes them so valuable. You hit the nail on the head. Get me one of those galls you have around here, and you won't regret it. It was just possible, Centurion Army Septus thought, that the influence of the powerful prefect might get him a posting away from this Jupiter-forsaken part of Gaul. Rome, sweet Rome, he thought wistfully. Hmm, he said. There certainly is one Gaul who's a little more harmless than the others. That's Cacophonix, the bard. He often goes for walks in the forest by himself, looking for inspiration. Excellent, said the prefect. Just the thing. I want this bard, and I want him fast. Meanwhile, in the Gaulish village, Asterix was sweeping his garden path, when Cacophonix himself strolled by, his lyre under his arm. Goodbye, Asterix, said the bard. I'm just going for a walk in the forest. Goodbye, Cacophonix, said Asterix. Thankfully, he'd been afraid for a moment that the bard was about to strike up there and then and give them a song in the village street. Next moment, Obelix came hurrying up with a menhir on his back. No, Cacophonix, no, he said urgently. Don't go into the forest. You mean I might meet a Roman patrol, said Cacophonix. Obelix, I'm deeply touched by your concern for my safety and well-being. It's not that, said Obelix. The Romans are keeping pretty quiet at the moment. The trouble is, when you sing in the forest, you scare the wild boars away. Boar, said Cacophonix, much offended. Let me tell you, those boars appreciate my music more than you do. That's not surprising, Asterix couldn't help saying. You sing like a pig after all. And he and Obelix fell about laughing, while the bard marched off down the road and out of the village. Barbarians! Savages, Philistines, he spuffled furiously to himself. The Roman patrol on its way through the forest was certainly doing its best to keep quiet. It was made up of eight or nine legionaries, all grumbling steadily as they trudged through the trees. Go and capture a bard, they grumbled. Go and capture a bard, easy enough to say that, ain't it? Go and capture a bard, they muttered. Why do we always get picked on to volunteer for dangerous missions? It isn't fair. It's just jolly well isn't fair. "'Shh!' hissed the Decurion, leading the patrol all of a sudden. "'Shut up! I heard a noise. Quick! Take cover!' They were approaching a large clearing in the forest. So was Cacophonix. He looked around and nodded with satisfaction. "'Yes, this will be a good place to sing,' he said. "'Right, here goes.' And he plucked his lyre and let fly. Maybe it's because I'm a Morrigan, he warbled, and I love a Morrigan. <laughs> the noise was something awful, and its effects were spectacular. The birds took flight. All other wildlife within earshot, including several boars and rabbits, a number of squirrels, and one Roman patrol, stampeded. These gorgeous secret weapons ought to be banned by the Helvetia Convention gasped the Decurion as he raced away. The Romans ran and ran until they could no longer hear that appalling song. When at last they stopped, they were pale and trembling, and disinclined to look one another in the eye. 
Finally, the Dakirian pulled himself together. Right, he said bracingly. I've thought of a way to counter that secret weapon of the bards. We all stuff our ears up. What with? asked one of his legionaries. The Dakirian looked around in search of inspiration. Parsley, he said. Plenty of parsley growing over there. Parsley, said the legionary, doubtfully. I don't really fancy that. I feel like something out of a butcher's shop. We could always add a pinch of thyme, suggested another of the men. Thyme and parsley stuffing is very good. I know a bank where on the wild thyme grows, he helpfully added. One bard will be quite enough round here, thank you very much, said the Dakirian, quelling him with a glance. Parsley it is. Everybody gets stuffed. Not up your nose, idiot, he patiently informed the man who didn't fancy parsley. In your years, and him back into ambush at the double. When I give the signal, we all attack the bard. Caught up in the throes of composition, Cacophonix had scarcely minded the lack of an audience for his latest song. Now, he murmured, what shall I sing next? Come on, boys, yelled the Dakirian grimly, leaping out of hiding. Here's the man we want. A fan, cried the delighted Cacophonix. At last, someone who appreciates good music. I don't believe I know that song you mentioned, my dear fellow, but you just stop right there. I will now give you an entire recital. And he began tuning his lyre, or to be precise, untuning it. Looking round, the defenceless Decurion saw he was alone. What had happened? It was unheard of for Roman soldiers to disobey orders. But he had no time to stop and work things out, since the bard was plainly addressing him. Why couldn't he hear what the man said? Of course, the parsley. Get an earful of this, the happy Cacophonix was saying, just as the Decurion unstoppered his left ear. And he launched into a spirited rendering of that chart-topping number, I'm only a bard in a gilded cage. It was too much for the poor Decurion. Unprotected now by Parsley, he could no longer bear the racket. Shrieking, stop it! Stop it! Mercy! For pity's sake, shut up! He started thumping the bard with such hysterical frenzy that Cacophonix, who had not had any potion before coming out, was soon overpowered and lay stunned on the ground. His lyre dropped from his hand. Oh! Oh, the relief of it, gasped the Decurion. But where the Hades are those men? And looking around him with much displeasure, he observed a number of helmeted heads peering round the bushes. Well, he inquired furiously, couldn't you hear me shouting, you cowardly lot? You'll be court-martial for this, I shouldn't wonder. Dereliction of duty, that's what it is, mutiny. Disobeying an officer. You'll end up with the lions in a circus, you will. You, pardon? said the legionary, removing a bunch of parsley. Oh, get unstuffed, said the Decurion crossly. Pick this bard up, bind him and gag him, gag him most securely, and then let's get back to camp. At least he had good news for his superior officer, so he was in a better temper by the time they arrived. Ave centurion army surplus, sir, he reported. Mission accomplished. We captured the Gaulish bard at the risk of our lives. "'Especially mine,' he finished with feeling. "'Excellent, excellent, my good fellow,' Prefect Odious Asparagus congratulated him jovially. "'There, you see,' he added, turning to a centurion army surplus, "'it wasn't all that difficult.' Army surplus, who had to live in those parts until and unless he got that highly desirable posting back to Rome, wasn't feeling anything like so cheerful. "'The trouble is,' he gloomily pointed out, we can now expect reprisals from the others. We? said Odious Asparagus. Oh, uh, well, well, yes, well, I really must be going now. Uh, oh, quick, please, sorry, I can't stay. Slaves, bring my litter. The prisoner and I will leave at once to board the galley for Rome. Meanwhile, back in the Gaulish village, it was beginning to occur to Asterix that Cacophonix had been gone rather a long time. He went to find his friend, who was sitting in his quarry, chipping out another large menhir. Obelix, he said, causing the big man to hit his thumb by mistake. You remember Cacophonix went for a walk in the forest? Well, he's not back yet. Obelix, who had been sucking his poor, hurt thumb, instantly brightened up. Whoa, 
That's good news, he said. On the other hand, he added less happily, I don't suppose he'll be gone much longer. Fortunately for Cacophonics, however, there had been a witness of his capture, a little Gaulish boy out hunting in the forest, who had seen it all from behind a big tree, without being spotted himself by the Roman patrol, and who now came running back to the village with his news. Asterix was the first man he saw as he dashed breathlessly down the road. Asterix, he gasped. Asterix, I saw some Romans capturing Cacophonix. Asterix was on the alert at once. Are you sure, Pick and Mix, he asked. Perfectly sure, said little Pick and Mix. I, I was out hunting wild boar piglets in a forest and I, I saw the whole thing. Funny ideas the Romans get, said Obelix, shaking his head in bafflement. Weird ideas they get. Why ever would they want to go lumbering themselves with cacophonix? Romans, he added. Well, I don't know. These Romans are crazy. Romans I shall never understand. Understand them or not, said Asterix briskly. This is an insult to the village and must be avenged. I'm off to tell Chief Vital Statistics the news. Chief Vital Statistics was outside his house picking apples, held aloft on his shield by his two shield-bearers, as befitted the dignity of a Gaulish chieftain. Chieftains were not supposed to walk on the ground like ordinary mortals. Hiya, he kept saying, seeing a particularly fine red apple just out of reach. The shield-bearers, staggering under his weight, did their best to obey. And a bit over to the left, and up, and we are to the right a little, got it? Hello, Asterisk. Why, why are you in such a hurry? Well, what's up? Oh, vital statistics. Our barred cacophonics has disappeared, reported Asterisk. Go on with you. You're just saying that to please me, said the sceptical vital statistics, reaching for another apple. No, it's true, Asterisk assured him. The Romans have kidnapped our bard. Young Pickenmix saw them. What? bellowed vital statistics, jumping up and down on his shield with righteous anger. By Teutatis, he exclaimed, swearing by the principal god of the Gauls. Those Romans certainly do get some peculiar notions. I mean, what on earth could they want cacophonics for? But even so, that's not playing fair. We can't have this sort of thing. Oh, dear me, no. He was getting quite worked up. We must organise a, a punitive expedition. Summon the whole village. This is urgent. Everyone, drop everything. Everyone. Us too, O oh chief, inquired the shield-bearers. Yes, of course, you idiots, snapped the irascible chieftain. Didn't you hear me? Everyone, drop everything. They dropped him. Everything within reason, said the chief a little later, struggling up with some difficulty. Everything within reason, I meant. Right, now let's go move on. Uh, a Gaul must know how to make his enemy respect him, and how to make his shield-bearers respect him too, come to that, he darkly added. Let the druid prepare the magic potion that gives us invincible strength. I could do with a bit of sticking plaster too. Soon afterwards, the Gaulish warriors were queuing up for the magic potion. Among them, a familiar figure with a large menhir on its back. No, Obelix, said Getafix the Druid wearily. Not you. How many times do I have to tell you you don't need any potion? You fell into the cauldron as a baby and it had a permanent effect on you. It would be dangerous for you to drink any more. You're quite strong enough already. What? Me strong, protested Obelix. Not a bit of it. I'm as weak as anything. Oh, come on, he pleaded. Look, I'll give you this nice men here. But Getafix was adamant. He and Obelix had frequently had this argument before. No, no, and for the umpteenth time, no, he said. Also, you should know better than to try bribing a Gaulish druid. Get a fix. Had all the men here as a man could possibly want at home anyway. When everyone except Obelix had had some potion, Chief Vital Statistics, back on his shield again, made an encouraging speech. Friends, Gauls, 
countrymen, he resoundingly began. We are going to give these Romans a good lesson by Tutatis. And remember, we have nothing to fear but the sky falling on our heads. Over in the fortified Roman camp of Compendium, Centurion Army Surplus, fully expecting trouble, had drawn up all his men in battle order and was making a similar speech, if with rather less conviction. And remember, he finished, as bracingly as he could, we have nothing to fear but the Gauls. That's what I was afraid of, muttered more than one of the troops. Sure enough, the Gauls, in cheerful mood, were on their way. I must say, this is the first time Cacophonix ever gave us any real entertainment, said Asterix happily. I say, Asterix, how about a bet? Oblix suggested. The one who knocks out most legionaries wins. And we have to collect their helmets as proof. What do you say? Done, said Asterix. And at that very moment, in compendium, Centurion Gracchus Army Surplus was issuing last minute orders. Helmets on! They're coming, gasped one of the two men on sentry duty at the camp gates, going green in the face as the Gauls appeared round the corner and came surging down the road. It's the Gauls! Sound the alarm! Then, seeing his companion about to obey with alacrity, he had second thoughts. No, wait, you stay here and uh, hold them off. I'll sound the alarm. Help! Help! The Gauls are coming! The Gauls are coming! He yelled, racing for dear life to the comparative safety of the interior of the camp. Mercy! Help! I want my mummy! Centurion Army surplus, however, was made of sterner stuff. He knew what was expected of a Roman and an officer. He'd been trained to carry out manoeuvres with the legendary precision of the Roman army, and he had every intention of putting his training into practice. Cohorts into three lines! Form! He barked out. The cohorts formed into three lines. Horns, trumpets and bouquinas! Sound! He bellowed. The horns, trumpets and bouquinas sounded. Pilums at the ready, he shouted. All the legionaries pointed their pilums, a kind of Roman spear, in the general direction of the camp gates and the advancing Gauls. And now, said Centurion Army Surplus, now by Jupiter, attack! At which moment, with a mighty whoosh, the Gauls of the little village, all tanked up with magic potion, came charging into the fortified Roman camp of Compendium. We can't attack, the legionaries pointed out, reasonably enough. The Gauls are in the way. And after that, they were unable to say anything more for quite some time, requiring all their breath for such military exertions as being biffed, bopped, thumped, walloped, thwacked, flying through the air and coming down with a thonk, and having their helmets systematically collected on the field of battle by Obelix. As battles go, it was short, but distinctly sharp, if you were on the Roman or losing side. Obelix's helmet collection grew by the minute, but Asterix wasn't playing the helmet game at all. He was looking for bards instead. Funny, I can't find Cacophonix anywhere, he was saying to himself, puzzled as he worked the Romans over. Where can he be? Ah, oh, there's the Roman commander at last. If anyone knows, he will. Seeing the terrible little Gaulish warrior advancing upon him, Centurion Gracchus' army surplus retreated until brought up short by the stout fence of the camp, where, having no choice in the matter, he made a brave stand. I shall fight to the death, he announced, going green in the face and quivering like a jelly. Want me to thump you? inquired Asterix, mildly, lifting the mighty Roman off his feet, armour and all with a finger hooked under his belt. The battle was still going on full blast. No hope of any reinforcements coming to my aid, thought Centurion Army Surplus. Being a sensible man, who liked to keep his feet on the ground, he gulped and said, hoping none of his men could hear him, Oh, all right, all is lost. Alia yecta est. As Caesar had been the first to make this remark, which meant the die is cast, Army Surplus felt that at least he was in good company. 
In case Asterix didn't understand Latin, he added hastily in Gaulish, Put me down, I surrender. And let it be a lesson to you not to go pinching other people's bards, said Asterix severely, not putting him down. I suppose once you'd heard him sing, you thought we wouldn't miss him, but you were wrong. We're a tough lot, we Gauls. We can put up with a few wrong notes in the cause of friendship. Now then, give us back our bard and don't go doing it again. The, the, the fact is, said poor Army Surplus, still suspended from Asterix's fingertip in midair, uh, well, the fact is, your bard's not here. Prefect Odious Asparagus took him on board his galley. He'll be on his way to Rome by now. The prefect's giving him to Caesar as a present. Vital statistics arrived just in time to hear that bit. His jaw dropped. Oh, really, said Asterix, disgusted. Why couldn't he have said so before? We've simply been wasting our time here. He tossed the unfortunate centurion over his shoulder and up in the air in the general direction of the fence. Oh, present, said Vital Statistics wonderingly, as the two Gauls walked away. Oh, present! Now, that is the funniest idea yet. You know something, Asterix? I'm inclined to agree with Obelix. He's, his Romans are crazy. Just then, Obelix himself surfaced from the fray, happily carrying a clanking great armful of Roman helmets. Look at this, Asterix, he said gleefully. Just look at this. I'm sure I've won our bet. And what's more, one legionary was fighting bareheaded. I'm sure it's against the rules to go into battle improperly dressed. I've a good mind to report him to his commanding officer. But his commanding officer was draped over the top of the camp fence, minus his own helmet, as the Gauls withdrew, leaving behind the aftermath of battle. And what a battle it had been. Even the ranks of Tuscany, in this case the flattened Roman legionaries, could scarce forbear to cheer. It's a knockout, they agree, faintly, lifting dazed heads from the ground. Some battle, said one man, spotting his commander sitting on the fence. I, I really let us have it, didn't I, sir? Gracchus' army surplus simply snarled at him. Once capable of human speech again, he roared furiously, Get this camp back into order, you idle, lazy lot! What's the idea of all this untidiness? Where's your military precision and discipline? Look at you, declining and falling about all over the place. And don't anyone, he added, as he slowly slid off the fence and fell to the ground himself, don't anyone ever mention this battle to me again. Get it? Got it? Good. The atmosphere in the Gaulish village wasn't much more cheerful. Asterix sat gloomily watching Obelix eat dinner. He could hardly manage a thing himself, and even Obelix could only force two or three whole roast boar down. Poor Cacophonix, mused Asterix sadly. Just think of him. A prisoner on board a Roman galley. Yeah, such a nice chap, oh Cacophonix, agreed Obelix, through a mouthful of boar. So, mm, so well brought up. <coughs> I'm never saying with his mouth full. <coughs> A pity he didn't eat much. <coughs> mm. In fact, the only cheerful character at this point in our story was Odious Asparagus, on board the galley and well out to sea, gloating over his Gaulish prisoner. The prefect's joy was unconfined. Oh, won't Caesar be pleased, he chuckled. I just can't wait to give you to him, Gaul. Your Caesar doesn't deserve me, Roman, Cacophonix said loftily. Get a move on, Odious Asparagus told the captain of the galley. Make the slaves row faster. And the drums that set the pace for the oarsmen beat faster. The overseer's whip cracked down harder. It was more than Cacophonix, a tender-hearted fellow, could bear. Stop having those unhappy souls whipped, Roman, he cried. Loosen my bonds. I, I will now give them a song to liven them up. And shortly he was all poised to render a spirited Gaulish sea shanty. Farewell and adieu to you, fair Celtic ladies, he carolled. The man playing the drums glowered. Farewell and adieu to you, 
ladies and gentlemen, the bard continued. All the oars tangled in the air with much crashing of their blades. The ship started to pitch and toss. Stop! yelled the slaves. Mercy! they begged. We'd rather have the whip! they cried. Bring back the whip! Our work isn't all fun and games, said the slave spokesman, when they'd calmed down sufficiently for him to make himself heard. Well, being slaves, I suppose we can expect to face the music, but please, please, not this sort. Cruel and inhuman punishment, that's what it is. Make the goal shut up, and we promise to increase productivity and row our hardest. You ungrateful, ignorant lot, protested Cacophonix, as he was dragged away and loaded with chains. You'll all end up in the galleys. We already did, the spokesman pointed out. And serve you jolly well right, said Cacophonix. But at this point a gag was shoved into his mouth, and he could say no more. More crucially, he could sing no more either. The joy of Prefect Odious Asparagus was less unconfined than before, as he sat looking at his fuming but mercifully silent prisoner. I'm beginning to wonder, he remarked thoughtfully, if Caesar really does deserve you. If Asterix had his way, nobody was ever going to find out if Caesar deserved Cacophonix. For as he watched his big friend Obelix picking gloomily at his fourth whole roast boar, Asterix had come to a decision. Obelix, he said firmly, we must go to Rome and rescue Cacophonix. Suits me, said Obelix, scrunching a last bone. But Rome's a long way off. How do we get there? Simple, said Asterix. All roads lead to Rome. However, I think we'll arrive sooner if we go part of the way by sea. We just go down to the beach and hitch a lift on the first boat for Rome. And the two friends went off to explain their plan to Chief Vital Statistics and get a fix the Druid. Huh, said the Chief. It's risky, Asterix, but oh, you're right. We can't leave our bard in a lurch. He sings atrociously, but he's a good sort. An excellent sort, agreed the Druid. X being the operative part of the word just now. He should be barred as a bard, but still we want him back. You come home to my house, Asterix, and I'll give you a good of magic potion for your journey. I'll just go and find someone to deliver my men here's while I'm away, said Obelix, making off in the opposite direction. He had spotted the village's oldest inhabitant, and thought a little light men here delivering might suit geriatrics. You can deliver just one at a time to start with, he explained, as the old man looked a little doubtfully at the quarry full of huge standing stones, so that was all right. And shortly afterwards, the two friends set off for the beach, seen off by all the Gauls shouting, Good luck! Mind how you go! Take care! Don't worry! Asterix called back. If the Romans aren't nice to us, we'll leave their city full of ruins! Obelix was beginning to have second thoughts as they reached the seashore. Not about the adventure itself, but he realised there was one thing they'd forgotten. Asterix he inquired. What's the Latin for wild boar? Singularis porcus, Asterix told him. Though come to think of it, I don't know if they have them in Rome. I suppose you could always eat an ox or so as a change. Now we just have to wait for a ship. Let's have another bet while we wait, said Obelix, looking greedily at the rocks, which had oysters all over them. We'll see how many oysters we can eat. The one who eats most wins a singularis porcus. But there wasn't time, for just then Asterix jumped up. Look, a sail, he cried. We're in luck. Obelix was a little disappointed. Why don't we wait for the next boat, he said. Then we could still have our bet. Don't be so childish, said Asterix. Think of Cacophonix and help me stop this ship. No doubt about it. The ancient Gaulish sign indicating a wish to be taken on board ship was more conspicuous when made by Obelix's massive hand. To make this sign, the four fingers of the hand were clenched into a fist, and the thumb jerked in the desired direction. For travellers wanting to go to Rome, 
the direction of the thumb was immaterial, since, as Asterix had already pointed out, all roads led there. And quite soon the ship spotted the would-be hitchhikers and came within earshot of the shore. "'It's a Phoenician galley,' Asterix told his friend as it sailed closer. "'The Phoenicians are famous sailors and merchants.' "'What's the Phoenician for Singularis Porcus?' asked Obelix, hopefully. Leaning over the side, the captain of the galley hailed the two Gauls. "'We're from Tyre, in Phoenicia,' he shouted. "'My name's Economic Crisis. Would you like to buy any of our wares? Glass, jewels, textiles, purple, furniture?' "'No, thanks,' Asterix shouted back. "'We want to go to Rome.' "'Right,' said the captain, after a moment's thought. "'Come on board!' After a brief swim, the two Gauls had boarded the handsome Phoenician vessel and were looking down on the men pulling the galley's great oars. "'Are those slaves?' asked Asterix. "'Oh, dear me, no! They're my business partners,' said Economic Crisis, the Phoenician merchant chuckling happily. "'You see, when we floated the company, I drew up the contract, and they failed to read the small print carefully before signing. I'm chairman and managing director.' and they have to do the rowing. Ha, ha, ha! Yes, uh, ho, ho, Asterix agreed, looking at the merchant a little doubtfully. Very kind of you to take us to Rome, I'm sure. I hope it doesn't mean going out of your way. Oh, that's all right, said the Phoenician. As it happens, we were planning to go to Rome anyway. A colleague of mine struck sail and abandoned his ship there. Dear me, said Asterix. What a tragedy. Did his ship sink? "'No, he sold it,' said Economic Crisis. "'He was better at striking that sort of sail, you see.' And speaking of sails, there came a sudden cry from the man up in the crow's nest at the top of the mast. "'A sail on the horizon, Mr. Chairman!' In some alarm, Economic Crisis looked the way the man was pointing. "'My ball! That looks like a pirate ship!' he cried. "'The pirates may take us prisoner, kill us, or even worse!' Even worse? Asterix wondered. Yes, said the Phoenician. They may steal our merchandise. This was indeed just what the pirates were planning to do. Sighting the rich prize ahead of them, the pirate captain was rubbing his hands with glee. <laughs> Shiver me timbers, we've got them, me arties, he told his crew. That heavy merchant vessel with all its cargo will never escape us. We'll just make one mouthful of those feeble, luxury-loving Phoenicians. <laughs> now, if it was Gauls, that'll be different. We know enough about indomitable Gauls to steer good and clear of them by now. But this lot's only Phoenicians. <laughs> and the rest of the pirates were looking forward to boarding the galley as well. On the galley itself, unfortunately, a slight difference of opinion had arisen. My dear fellow directors, economic crisis told his oarsmen, I rather think we shall be obliged to fight. But of course they had read his crafty contract properly now. No, Mr. Chairman, said a spokesman firmly. The contract says we have to row. Fair enough. But there's nothing in the small print about fighting. Now I suggest we change that contract. I have an important modification I should like to make. Me too, said everyone else. Yeah, yeah, me too. We might, on the one hand, said the spokesman hold an extraordinary general meeting to discuss the terms of the contract, while on the other hand, alternatively, all things being taken into consideration and due weight being given to every factor. Here Asterix drew Obelix over to the ship's side. I shouldn't think these chatterboxes will ever get round to fighting at all, Obelix, he whispered. Looks to me as if we'll have to deal with this little contretemps on our own. What's a contretemps? asked Obelix. Pirates, in the circumstances said Asterix. Oh, goody, said Obelix, brightening up. Well, if you don't think the Phoenicians will mind, that makes all the more pirates for us. Look, here they come, poor things. Ooh, Asterix, he added, getting all excited. They're wearing helmets. We can have another bet, like we did with the legionaries. Oh, do let's. Oh, do let's. Next moment, the pirate captain was leaping athletically on board the Phoenician galley waving his cutlass, and totally unprepared to see two Gauls leap in the opposite direction. 
boarding his own ship and waving nothing but their bare fists. Moreover, none of his crew followed him. Within seconds they were all fully occupied. Yet again the contest was short and sharp. Makes a nice change fighting on a boat now and then, observed Asterix, sending a couple of pirates flying. Don't you agree, Obelix? It's fun, said Obelix enthusiastically, disposing of three or four more. Ooh, it's fun. I say, would you let me have that pirate of yours, Asterix, just so's I can finish him off? But pretty soon the fun was all over. A gentle tap from Obelix sent the mast of the pirate ship crashing down. Right, that's that said Asterix, dusting his hands together. You mean it's over? What a shame, said Obelix sadly. I thought these pirate galleys carried bigger crews. And they didn't all play fair either, he added, juggling yet another pile of helmets. I saw one jump into the sea to get away. That's against the rules. I'm sure it is. They'll all be in the sea in a moment, said Asterix, and so will we unless we rejoin the Phoenicians. Sure enough, the pirate ship was capsizing, taking the crew to join their captain, who had already been heaved overboard by economic crisis and his board of directors. Well, who was I to know it was those Gauls again, said the pirate captain, defensively, as they started swimming the long, long way to shore. You might have guessed it, said his cabin boy. Gauls? I never miss the boat. Asterix and Obelix were welcomed back on board the Phoenician galley as it sailed away in its usual stately fashion. "'You have saved what's dearest to our hearts,' cried Economic Crisis. "'You've saved our cargo. Come to my arms. To tell you the truth, I originally intended to sell you as slaves when we called in at the next port. But now I won't. I'll take you to Rome as we agreed. What do you say to that, then?' "'Big of you,' said Asterix slightly surprised by these revelations. You certainly have a lot of business acumen, economic crisis. Ah, well, what can you expect? said the merchant comfortably. As my partners and I were agreeing just now, we're all in the same boat, and if our overheads aren't to make us go under, we mustn't rest on our oars. So get rowing! he suddenly bellowed at his fellow directors. But what, you may ask, had been happening to Cacophonix all this time. By now he had arrived in Rome, to be led in chains before Caesar by Prefect Odius Asparagus. Ave Caesar, said Odius Asparagus politely. I've brought you a gift. Ave Odius Asparagus, Prefect of Gaul, said Caesar, none too thrilled at the thought of yet another useless present. Well, what is it? A little souvenir of Gaul, O oh Caesar, said Odius Asparagus, very proud of himself, also rather thankful to be parting company with Cacophonix. It's a Gaulish bard, that's what it is, one of those indomitable Gauls from a little village near Compendium. Well, really, thought Cacophonix indignantly, souvenir indeed, just as if I was a vulgar painted seashell. A bard, fancy that. How interesting, said Caesar, not managing to sound very interested, which annoyed Cacophonix yet further. You can jolly well wait for the cows to come home before I'll sing for you, O oh Caesar, he said to himself, and you'll never know what you're missing. Just serves you right. Well, thanks for this original little gift, Prefect, said Caesar, inspecting the bard without noticeable enthusiasm. You may uh, go and he snapped his fingers at a nearby servant. "'Send for um, Caius Fatuus, the gladiator trainer,' he told the man. Pretty soon, the big beefy man who was in charge of all the gladiators for the Roman games turned up to see Cacophonix for himself. "'Well, Fatuus,' said Caesar, "'can you make a gladiator of this bard?' "'Oh, dear me, no!' said the gladiator trainer, shaking his head. No, I'm afraid not. Oh, no chance. No, he's, he's too weak, you see. Not enough meat on him. Ooh, thought Cacophonix. If I wasn't restraining myself out of sheer good manners, I'd jolly well break all these chains and show you. Right, said Caesar. 
Then you can just um, throw him to the lions at the next games. Take him away with you when you are like this palace kept neat and tidy. And so poor Cacophonix was taken away and locked up in a cell near the Circus Maximus, where prisoners were thrown to the lions at the Roman games, without ever getting a chance to sing to Julius Caesar at all. But help was on the way. The Phoenician galley was nearing the end of its voyage. Rome is only a few hours' walk from the seaport where we were about to put in, economic crisis told the two Gaulish heroes. We'll be here for a while to buy and sell goods, lying at anchor. Lying? said Asterix. Well, only a bit of sales talk, said economic crisis. Perfectly legitimate. If you finish your own business in time, meet us here and we'll take you back to Gaul. Thanks, economic crisis, said Asterix, and he and Obelix disembarked. Hoist the flag, economic crisis shouted. An extremely handsome flag rose to the ship's masthead. The Gauls stopped on the quayside to stare at it. What does it say, Asterix? asked Obelix, who was not a great reader. Sail, said Asterix. It's a flag, said Obelix, puzzled. Not a sail? The other kind of sail, said Asterix. Final reductions, it says underneath. Unrepeatable offers. What does that mean, then? asked Obelix, shaking his head. Can't tell you, can I? Asterix pointed out. They're unrepeatable. Do stop asking silly questions and let's be on our way to Rome. The way was a very famous road called the Via Appia. They knew because it said so on a milestone. The road itself was broad and well paved and very busy, and the two Gauls had never seen anything like it before. By two Tartis, said Asterix, impressed. If the roads outside the city are as wide and straight as this, what must Rome itself be like? Crowded, was the answer. Full of all sorts of fine buildings and paved streets and people. The Gauls, who lived in a little country village, thought it was particularly full of people. There were visitors from all over the Roman Empire come to see the sights of the big city. Egyptians and Greeks, ancient Britons, Helvetians, Hispanians, Assyrians, Medes and Persians, Phoenicians, but most of the people were Romans, of course. Obelix looked hopefully at part of a legion marching past. How about the helmet game again? he suggested. We could have a lovely fight with all these Roman soldiers. No, no, said Asterix. No time for fun and games just now. We must start making inquiries. And I think I see what we need, he added, heading for an attractive building with bunches of grapes hanging round the windows and a sign above it saying, Gaulish Restaurant. Ooh, yes, said Obelix happily, also spotting a menu on the wall outside, advertising boar on the spit. Just what we need. I meant, said Asterix, we're likely to find some of our fellow countrymen in there. Still, we could put back a boar or so at the same time, he admitted, discovering that he felt quite hungry himself after their long walk along the Appian Way. No sooner did they enter the restaurant than the busy Gaulish proprietor hurried past carrying a huge succulent roast boar. Just recline at this table, he told the two Gauls. I'll be with you in a minute. Recline? said Asterix doubtfully, looking at the couches beside the restaurant tables. Doesn't sound to me very good for the digestion. But looking around, he saw that all the other customers were lying back, propped on their elbows, and Obelix happily sank onto a couch, breathing in the delicious aroma of boar. Oh, well then, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Asterix muttered to himself, settling as comfortably as he could. In a moment, the proprietor came bustling back. Good evening, said Asterix. We came in here because we're Gauls. Well, we actually came in here for some wild boar, said Obelix a little anxiously, in case the boar got away. We came in here for some wild boar because we're Gauls, Asterix agreed. Well, fancy that, said the proprietor. Fellow countrymen, nice to meet you. My name's Instant Mix. I've been living here in Rome for quite a while. I'm saving up to open a Roman restaurant back home in Lutetia, you see. 
And the other reason we came in, said Asterix, firmly interrupting the proprietor's life history, is because we're looking for a friend, a bard, actually. Well, sort of a bard. Well, anyway, he's been given to Julius Caesar as a present. At this, Instant Mix stared at the Gauls as if in surprise and alarm, made several interesting faces, the meaning of which was hard to interpret, and hurried off again. How odd, said Asterix. He just went away without a word. And without our order, too, said Obelix, quite seriously worried. However, he had no cause for anxiety. Very soon, Instant Mix hurried by to leave a couple of sizzling, hot, deliciously fragrant and juicy roast wild boars on their table. Ten minutes or so later, he came back and addressed Asterix in a hoarse whisper. Take care. Come and see me this evening. I carved my address on a tablet and slipped it in one of the boars. Ah, oh, that'll have been the bit that was rather hard to swallow, said Obelix picking the last bone clean. He looked a little sadly at his empty plate, and then brightened. I'll tell you what. Bring us your address again. Inside another boar. This time the Gauls retrieved it safely. Right, said Asterix, as they left the restaurant. So we've got a date to meet Instant Mix this evening. What shall we do to fill in time until then? We could always go back into his restaurant and uh, have some more boar suggested Obelix, who had only had half a dozen. No, said Asterix, it's perfectly obvious. Instant Mix doesn't want the Romans suspecting he's in league with us, and we don't want to make ourselves conspicuous. Me? Conspicuous? said Obelix indignantly. Asterix looked at his friend and sighed. Obelix, he said, anyone who eats six boars at a sitting is going to be a, just a trifle conspicuous. Come on. I've often heard tell of the famous Roman baths, and that looks like them on the other side of the street. Let's go and have a bath. The Gauls went into the Roman baths. At home they were used to bathing in a wooden tub in front of the fire, and rather expected a tub or so here, perhaps on a grander scale, but there was no such thing in sight. Only a hall with a great deal of glossy tiling, and several rooms leading off it. You get undressed. In the apoditorium, said the slave, taking people's money at the cash desk. You know what? asked Obelix. I think he means changing room, said Asterix, and he proved to be right. Soon the two Gauls came out of the apoditorium clad in nothing but towels. A smallish towel for Asterix, and a giant emperor-sized towel for Obelix. Another slave was waiting. This way, noble lords, he said. Noble what? said Obelix. I think he means us, said Asterix. Shaking his head, Obelix followed his friend into a room labelled Sudatorium, with great clouds of what looked like mist wafting out of it. He was beginning to feel very dubious about this bathing notion. We haven't got much on, he muttered. I just hope we don't catch cold, that's all. There was little likelihood of that. The room still contained no tub, just a lot of fat Romans wearing next to nothing, and the vapour in the room proved to be steam. Whew, whew, said Asterix. It's hot in here. I wonder why they don't open a window, said Obelix, looking around for one, but there weren't any. I think the idea is to work up a good sweat, said Asterix, who was quick at learning his way around. We're doing that all right, said Obelix. No sweat. I mean, I am sweating. I, I, I mean, uh, you mean you've had about enough of this room, said Asterix helpfully. So have I. Let's try the one next door, saying Caldarium. Saying what? asked Obelix. This time Asterix had to admit he didn't know. But it sounds as if it might be cooler, he said. Some Romans, draped over a stone bench, had caught part of this conversation. Hey, see that, Caius Fatuous? one of them whispered peering through the steam at the two Gauls. You're always on the lookout for new supplies of gladiators. What do you think of these two men? Caius Fatuous followed the direction of his friend's gaze. Mm, yes, he said, looking appreciatively at Obelix. Interesting, especially the fat one. Obelix was still shaking his head at the curious ways of the Romans 
as he left the sudatorium. "'This was a funny idea of yours by two Tartis, he told Asterix. "'Aho, thought Caius Fatuous, the gladiator trainer. He said, by two Tartis. Two Tartis is the principal god of the ancient Gauls. Therefore, he concluded, as the wheels of his mind went slowly round, therefore, QED, they must be Gauls. I could do with a couple of good Gaulish warriors in the arena. And he got up and followed them into the Caldarium, which they had just discovered was even steamier than the Sudatorium. They were rapidly turning the colour of cooked lobsters in a pool of very hot water. Phew, said Asterix again. We may be hard-boiled ourselves, but this is overdoing it. Caius Fatuous coughed politely. <clears throat> Excuse me, you seem to be uh, strangers here. I'll guide you round the bars if you like. I come here regularly for my health, though for a busy man like me it sometimes is a bit of a sweat. What you want to do now is go to the Frigidarium. The what? said Obelix. And dive into the pool of icy water. Caius Fatuous finished. Obelix lost all interest in Latin vocabulary. Icy water? I'm on my way, he cried, dashing into the Frigidarium. The inviting pool lay straight ahead of him. Watch me dive, Asterix! Watch me dive, he cried and took a mighty leap. There was the most enormous splosh. When the air cleared, the inviting pool lay all around the room. Obelix was left sitting on the tiles at the bottom. Hey, where did the water go? he asked, puzzled. Asterix sighed quietly. It went out when you went in, Obelix, he explained. There, um, there wasn't room for both of you. What an imposing bulk, murmured Caius Fatuous, more to himself than anyone else. But Obelix heard him. Not suggesting I'm fat, are you Roman? he inquired menacingly. Were you suggesting I was fat then? Good gracious, no, my dear fellow, Caius Fatuous assured him. No, 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 no. He could tell this was a touchy point. Just well... Nicely covered, that's all. To his relief, Obelix nodded. Evidently, he had said the right thing. Still, he thought it best to change the subject. And now, he told the Gauls, it is customary to have some massage. Asterix, who was willing to try anything once, was soon on the masseur's marble slab. But when an enormous, beefy, muscular slave started pummeling him, he took offence. He wasn't used to being pushed around. With a flick of his wrist, the little warrior sent the huge slave flying. By the time the slave landed on his own slab, he was out cold. At this juncture, the manager of the baths appeared. You've no right to beat up my masseurs, he protested. Have you any idea how much they cost this season? Out, both of you. Go and have a bath somewhere else. Well, he started it, said Asterix, truthfully, pointing to the stunned slave. That's right, agreed the loyal Obelix. I saw him. Caius Fatuous, who had hitherto been concentrating on the enormous obelix, was now equally impressed with Asterix. By Jupiter, what strength, he thought to himself. He'd be a sensation in the arena. We could bill him as the, the mighty midget from ancient Gaul. Oh, I absolutely must have these two men. I'll just send a couple of my strong-armed men to pick them up, in case they won't come quietly and he slipped out while the Gauls were still arguing with the manager. The manager fairly soon won the argument, since once Asterix had calmed down, he remembered that they were in Rome to rescue Cacophonix, and didn't want to get into any fights just yet. He and Obelix, both slightly ruffled, left the baths, and were soon strolling through the streets to the addressed instant mix the restaurant proprietor had given them. It turned out to be an apartment block, something Obelix had never seen before. Nor at Asterix, for he knew what such places were called. It's an insular, a place where people live on top of each other, he informed his friend. On top of each other, said Obelix, shaking his head. These Romans are crazy. I always told you so. They climbed several flights of stairs. Here we are, said Asterix. 
The third floor. That's where Instant Mix lives. Now, will you believe me? inquired Obelix. These Romans are crazy. Look, never mind all that, said Asterix impatiently. Stop wasting time. Just knock at this door, will you? Right, said Obelix. There was a mighty crash and the door caved in. Somebody squealed. I said knock, yelled Asterix, controlling his temper with difficulty. I did not say knock it down. I did not say smash it in. I did not. All right, all right, no need to shout, said poor Obelix. You know I can't tell the difference between knocking and smashing. Listen, I'm sorry, I'm... What's the idea of all this? said the person who had squealed. A large Roman matron was standing in the shattered doorway. Um... "'Awfully sorry, ma'am,' said Asterix politely. "'Does Instant Mix live here?' "'No,' said the Roman lady with awful dignity. "'He lives opposite.' "'Right,' said Obelix, willing and helpful as ever. "'Or oh, just knock.' There was another mighty crash. Another door caved in. "'Don't touch any more doors!' Asterix almost screamed. "'I wish,' said Obelix, "'you wouldn't keep shouting so.' It upsets me. I didn't shout at you when you got us into hot water back at those baths, did I? And what about my door? shouted the Roman matron. Who's going to pay for my door? Let's have a bit of peace, yelled a neighbour, leaning over the banisters in his nightshirt. We're trying to sleep in here by Jupiter. This interruption came in handy for the Gauls, since the matron and her neighbour were obviously enemies of long standing. "'You can't talk by Mercury!' the matron shouted back up the stairs. "'Practising the lyre all night, every night!' "'Oh, and how about you, then, by Vulcan?' inquired her neighbour. "'Holding orgies every Karen's!' But here Instant Mix appeared in his own ruined doorway, beckoning the Gauls in, and they left his neighbours to their slanging match. "'Nice little place you've got here,' said Asterix, looking around him. "'Yes, not bad,' agreed Instant Mix. "'Cubiculum?' Kitchen, triclinium, and a running water down the road at the aqueduct. It's a GLC flat. A what flat? asked Obelix. GLC, Greater Latin Council, said Instant Mix. Now then, about your friend, he added, pouring wine for his guests as they reclined on couches. They were getting the hang of it quite well by now. I think I can give you some information. Word's been going around about a bard, Prefect Odius Asparagus, brought back from Gaul as a present for Caesar. At least the Prefect says he's a bard, though I believe one eminent Roman music critic heard him sing and said Odius Asparagus had been sold a perp. So I don't know if that's your man after all. That's our man, said Asterix, with conviction. Well, I, I hardly like to tell you this, then, said Instant Mix. But it seems that these bards to be thrown to the lions at the next games in the Circus Maximus in just a few days' time. We'll rescue him, said Asterix, sitting up and thumping the table with his fist. I'm afraid you can't, his host told him. The bard's been shut up in a cell in a circus, and it's a maximum security circus. And there's worse to come. That's why I warned you to take care. You must be indomitable gauls like the bard. You must flee from Rome. But we're indomitable, Asterix pointed out. So what's the problem? Caius Fatuus, the gladiator trainer, is looking for more men for the games, explained Instant Mix. And indomitable gauls are in great demand. You don't want to end up in the arena, do you? Yes, if it's the way to rescue Cacophonix said Asterix. We indomitable Gauls stop at nothing, you know. No old bard to save our bard. Well, thank you very much for the information, Instant Mix. Come along, Obelix. Let's get moving. Little did the two Gauls know, as they emerged into the street, that two huge, hulking Roman thugs were lying in wait for them in the shadows. There they are, said one thug under his breath. Let's get them. But Asterix was on the alert at once. We're being attacked. He whispered to his friend. Oh, good, said Obelix happily. About time we saw some action. The action was short and sharp. Too short for Obelix's liking, and much too sharp for the Romans. Only two, Obelix asked his flattened victims, 
sounded disappointed. Aren't there any more of you? But the man was beyond answering. Obelix picked him up and shook him in an effort to get some sense out of him. But this didn't appear to work, and the two Gauls set off in search of an inn where they could spend the night. Some little time later, the Roman thugs scraped themselves off the ground and made their way back to their master, groaning. Well, said Caius Fatuus, the gladiator trainer, hopefully. Did you get me those Gauls? Uh, not exactly, boss, said one feebly. They uh, didn't want to come, see, explained his companion. And I suppose you let them escape, said Caius Fatuus grimly. Well, in a way, said the first thug. Sort of. And you can't say where they've gone, his boss inquired. Um, uh, not, not in so many words, no, said the second thug. Here Caius Fatuus lost his temper. You hopeless weeds, he yelled. You stupid wits. I must have those two men. Jump to it, everyone, he shouted at his entire household. Find where those Gauls have gone. The trouble about that was the sheer size of the city of Rome, something which amazed Asterix and Obelix. Look, said Asterix, after they'd been walking for a while, see that round building with all the arches? That'll be the Circus Maximus, I bet. Yes, it must be. There's an inn opposite called the Circus Inn. That should suit us nicely. Right, said Obelix. The only thing is, Asterix added, looking doubtfully at the thick, sturdy, iron-bound door, which seemed very firmly closed indeed, I wonder if they'll let us in at this time of night. I'll just knock, said Obelix, helpfully. That will be twenty sestertii for the night, and forty sestertii for the door, said the innkeeper a little later, carving their names down on the register. Asterix didn't trust himself to say a thing. After a good night's sleep, however, he felt better, and went down to breakfast with Obelix ready for anything. First of all, he told his friend as they sat at their table, we must try to get into conversation with one of the circus guards and find out exactly where Cacophonix is imprisoned. Luck was on their side. A Roman legionary came racing into the inn at that very moment. Waiter, he gasped, grabbing the man who was serving the Gauls breakfast. Have you by any chance got any parsley? Parsley, said the waiter blankly. Not for. For stuffing in my ears, wailed the soldier. I'm guarding this prisoner, see? He keeps on singing. Something horrible it is. Cacophonix, whispered Asterix. Description fits anyway, agreed Obelix, through a mighty mouthful of ham. Let's try a few crafty questions on this guard, Asterix said in a low voice. We must go about it cautiously. We don't want to arouse his suspicions. No, we don't, agreed Obelix. Are you, he added, raising his voice. Yes, you. The legionary. Where's Cacophonix imprisoned? Oh, I love your idea of caution, moaned Asterix quietly. I just love it. Cell 28, first basement down, but it's a secret, said the guard obligingly. There, Obelix triumphantly told his friend. It worked, didn't it? A little later, the two friends were strolling over to the great building of the Circus Maximus itself. I'll just take a little magic potion, said Asterix producing the gird Getafix the Druid had given him. Now, here's my crafty plan for rescuing the bard. We knock down everyone and everything in sight until we find Cacophonix. Then we make off with him. That's a really crafty plan, said Obelix happily. It was just up his street. Halt, said the man on guard at the main gates. No entry! He added, several feet up in the air above the main gates. But the Gauls were already through them and exploring the corridors of the circus basements, flattening any Roman soldiers who happened to be in the way. Cell 25, 26, 27, said Asterix. We're getting warm. I bet about the helmets is still on, isn't it? Said Obelix, picking up his sixth. But Asterix took no notice. He had just reached cell 28. The door was wide open and... Oh, no, cried Asterix. It's empty. Outside, however stood the guard they had met in the inn, and he recognised them. Hey, he said, taking the parsley out of one ear. What are you two doing down here? Where's the bard, guard? asked Asterix grimly. 
pinning him to the wall and shaking him ever so delicately. They changed his cell, gasped the soldier. He's somewhere in the third basement down because nobody could bear to hear him any more and please would you kindly stop doing that? Come on, said Obelix, preparing to forge on down to the third basement. No, I think not, said Asterix. No, I'd say this calls for a little more thought. Let's go and see our friend Instant Mix. He's full of good advice. Good idea, said Obelix. His bores aren't bad either. Sound the alarm! Somebody yelled in the depths of the great building. The Gauls strolled quietly back the way they had come. Obelix picked up a few more helmets in passing. Halt! said the man on guard at the main gates. No extra! He added, several feet up in the air above the main gates. But the Gauls were out by then. News of the goings-on in the Circus Maximus soon came to the ears of Caius Fatuus, the gladiator trainer, in his own luxurious quarters. Two Gauls trying to rescue the bard, he said delighted. Those must certainly be my men, and they must certainly be indomitable Gauls. That's what the guard said, agreed the man who had brought the message. I want the whole staff out, combing the city in groups of three, said Fatuus briskly. I must have those two Gauls. Bring them here. And if they still can't be found, put up wanted notices everywhere. I'm offering ten thousand sestertii to anyone who turns in those two indomitable Gauls. The staff of the Circus Maximus were all enormous, muscular and immensely strong. One group of three had, of course, gone straight to the Gaulish restaurant, where our heroes had been spotted the night before, and they were in luck. Out strolled the two Gauls, looking well fed. Let's get them, said the leader of the party, coming up behind Asterix and Obelix. It's a nuisance, you know, Obelix, what Instant Mix told us about the Circus Maximus, remarked Asterix, swiping the huge man casually out of the way. Makes me come over all faint, agreed Obelix, knocking the heads of the other two men together and dropping them in the gutter. Hearing things like that? He said, only condemned men... Lions and gladiators get into the circus, continued Asterix, strolling round the corner. Why don't we dress up as lions, said Obelix. Here they come, whispered the leader of another party of thugs, lying in wait just up the street. You're too fat for a lion, said Asterix, without thinking, as he brushed the leader of this second party aside. I am not fat, Obelix protested, dealing with the second man. Sorry. Asterix apologised. I know. He disposed of the third man. Just well covered. All the same, we must save our bard. Of course, agreed Obelix, as they started to cross the road. Raising his dazed head, the leader of the second party of thugs saw a patrol of armed men coming up the street. Hey, here come the cops, he told his companions hoarsely. We'd better beat it. They beat it. Leaving Asterix and Obelix, to meet the oncoming party of military police, who had been alerted by the sound of battle. Neo, 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 what's all this here? said the patrol commander severely. You just come along of us down to the station, and mind you come nice and quiet now, no funny business. We are seven to two. Is that all? said Obelix sadly, starting to add more helmets to his collection. Let's get back to our inn, said Asterix, helping out with the last two or three men. Don't you think, asked Obelix thoughtfully, as they approached the circus inn, it's rather funny, all these people attacking us. People, said Asterix, what people? He spent a moment working things out, and then added, I could do with another bite of lunch, though. Gentle exercise is good for the appetite. Over their second lunch, he had a brainwave. I know, Obelix, he cried. I know the way to get into the circus. We'll become gladiators ourselves. We will? asked Obelix. How? Let's ask a Roman, said Asterix. The only Roman we know in this city is that one who said he takes a lot of baths. Let's go and see if he's taking one now. Come on! There seemed to be a considerable crowd of people outside the baths, all peering at large slabs put up on the walls. What's it say? One man at the back of the crowd was asking. Read it out, somebody. A man at the front obliged. 
Ten thousand sesterti, I, he read, for the capture of two dangerous indomitable Gauls, one small fair man, big moustache, winged helmet, one fat ginger-haired man, big moustache, pigtails, signed Caius Fatuus, gladiator trainer. Ten thousand sesterti, I, said one Roman citizen. That's a lot of money. I could just do with ten thousand sesterti, I, agreed a second Roman citizen. Luke, said a third Roman citizen, pointing up the street. Here come ten thousand sesterti, I. There was much pushing and shoving as people shouted, I spotted them first. No, me, it's a lie. Those ten thousand sesterti are mine. What on earth is all this? said Asterisk impatiently. Let us buy, do, we're in a hurry. And he and Obelix made their way through the crowd, which went flying in all directions, and into the baths. Oh, it's you two back again, is it? said the manager of the baths, grimly, confronting them at the top of the steps. I thought I'd tell you before, I don't want... But the rest of what he was saying was lost, as he went flying through the air and came down splosh in the cold pool of the frigidarium. Oi! shouted one of his angry customers. You've got your sandals on. Disgusting, that's what it is. You just take those sandals off if you want to come in the bath. I hope that Roman's here, said Asterix, as he and Obelix strolled on. He did say he came to the baths regularly, and apparently the Romans have a bath every day. These Romans, agreed Obelix, are crazy. They went into the sudatorium. Ah, there he is, said Asterix, recognising a large figure in nothing but a towel. Caius Fatuus recognised the Gauls, too. The Gauls, he thought to himself, sweating even more than he was meant to. Help! My men haven't captured them, and they've come to get even. They've got me in a hot seat. I'll have to throw the towel in now. However, he decided against that when Asterix marched up to him. Since the towel was all he was wearing, he was going to feel even more defenceless without it. He observed with a nasty sinking feeling that Asterix seemed delighted to see him. We were looking for you, said the little Gaul, confirming his worst fears. Listen, stammered poor Fatuous. I, 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 can, I can explain everything. How good, said Asterix. What a bit of luck. Then you can tell us how we get to be Roman gladiators. Gladiators, said Caius Fatuous, unable to believe his years, or indeed his own luck either. Gladiators? You, you want to be gladiators? That's right. Said Asterix, patiently. Well, oh, well, you've come to the right man, chortled Fatuous. For I am Caius Fatuous, the biggest gladiator trainer in Rome. Right, said Asterix. Train us then. Certainly, happily, by all means, said Fatuous. Delighted, my dear fellows, delighted. And in no time he was back in his clothes and leaving the baths with his new recruits. He was slightly surprised to see the tangled heap of Roman citizenry piled outside the entrance. What's been going on here? he wondered. They seem to want to stop us getting into the baths, Asterix told him. No offence meant, but these Romans are crazy, Obelix explained. Caius gazed at the Gauls' handiwork in some awe. Ooh, won't Caesar just be pleased with me, he thought gleefully. Just wait till he sees what I've got for the next games. My fortune's made, but I must make sure they don't get away again. I must win their confidence. I'll soften them up until they're ready to sign the contract, which gets them into my hot little hands. Come along in, he said jovially, as they reached his own quarters. How about a little light meal? Could we uh, make it a big... Heavy meal, suggested Obelix, hopefully, but Asterix shushed him. Soon they were reclining at a table laden with luxurious delicacies from all over the Roman Empire. Just taste these pasties, Caius Fatuus urged his guests. A new recipe, very popular in Roman high society. They cost a fortune. What's in them? asked Asterix wearily. Caius Fatuus smacked his lips. Nightingale's tongues imported from northern Gaul, he said. Sturgeon's eggs from the farthest of barbarian lands. Cockroaches' gums from out of Mongolia. He added, biting into one. Well, 
What do you think of them? Obelix put three at once into his huge mouth and munched briefly. Salty, he said. Salty? gasped Fatuous, not at all jovial any more. These choice gourmet delicacies salty? Is that all you can find to say? No, said Obelix, still feeling optimistic. Is there any boar for the next course? Boar? You boar? snapped Fatuous. Right, the fun's over. I want your marks on these contracts and sharpish. And he produced a couple of little tablets and styluses, which were indeed quite sharp. Asterix could easily tell that Caius Fatuous was up to a bit of sharp practice himself, but neither he nor Obelix had any objection to signing the contracts which bound them to perform as gladiators, since that was exactly what they wanted. Good, said Fatuous, snatching the tablets back in case they changed their minds. He raised his voice and yelled, Insalubrious! I beg your pardon, said Asterix, rather offended, since he had taken a bath only the day before. But it turned out that Insalubrious was the name of the man who strode into the room next moment. Caius Fatuous, who liked the pleasures of his elegant table, was not quite literally the biggest gladiator trainer in Rome, because Insalubrious, who did the actual donkey work of training for him, was half a size bigger again. He had arms and legs like tree trunks, and a torso like a barrel, and all of it was solid muscle. He had huge, broad shoulders, and no neck to speak of, a bristly shaven head, and a mean expression on his face. Insalubrious, said Caius Fatuous, take these two new gladiators away, and train them for the circus, and jump to it. Ho, ho, they'll do the jumping, sir, said Insalubrious, with a cackle of evil laughter. <laughs> they'll jump to it, all right. And soon the Gauls were just where they wanted to be, in the heart of the huge Circus Maximus building itself. These are the gladiators' quarters, Insalubrious told them, as they marched through a gateway and into a practice arena, where several large, tough men, dressed in a curious assortment of armour, were scuffling with each other. Right. We'll start your training right away. Oh, good, said Asterix. We are in rather a hurry. Funny, eh? snarled the trainer, glaring at the little warrior. I'll teach you to take that insolent tone with me. I'm about to make you into a couple of formidable fighting machines, I am. You'll be capable of any feat of arms when I've finished with you. Scared? You should be. Dear me, yes, said Asterix, chuckling. I've got cold feet already. Never mind the arms. Oh, oh, stop it, Asterix, Obelix begged. You're giving me the giggles. Insalubrious did not think his new recruits were taking this anywhere near as seriously as they should. You, fatty, he snarled at Obelix. Try punching me. Can I, said Obelix, thrilled. Can I really? Ooh, thanks. But Insalubrious was quicker on his feet than he looked and swerved out of the way of Obelix's enormous fist. Hey, 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 he chuckled. Obelix tried again. This time, Insalubrious ducked in the other direction. <laughs> he chortled. Asterix, tell him to stand still, Obelix complained. But the trainer was advancing on him, fists clenched. My turn now, he said gleefully, punching Obelix in the stomach with all his might. To his astonishment, Obelix just stood there and never so much as flinched. Uh, you see, said Obelix, I don't keep ducking about, do I? Insalubrious snarled a little more and turned to Asterix. Right, he said. Now then, Titch, your turn to... But whatever he'd been going to say, he never got a chance, because Asterix had hit him right out of his sandals and way up into the air, where he hovered for a second or so before coming down to the sand of the arena again with a tremendous thud. You just have to move a little faster, Obelix. That's all there is to it, Asterix explained. It's all those baths you made me take, Obelix grumbled. I must have sapped my strength. What's out, Gauls? gasped Insalubrious, coming round. I've got you marked down. Insalubrious is furious, one of the gladiators who had been watching told Asterix. 
I wouldn't give much for your chances. You wouldn't have to, if we're marked down, Asterix pointed out, sending Obelix into another fit of the giggles. Insalubrious was a tough character, however. Getting to his feet again, he pointed to Obelix. You, fatty! I am not fat, said Obelix dangerously. Insalubrious took no notice. I'm going to train you as a Ricciarius! I what? said Obelix. A gladiator who fights with a trident and a net, said the trainer. You have to catch your opponent in the net like a fish. Come on, have a go. Here's the net and the stick we use for a trident in training. And Insalubrious drew a wicked-looking short sword of his own and shaped up to attack. Don't you have a stick to? inquired Obelix. <laughs> I'm not training, chuckled Insalubrious nastily. Fair enough, said Obelix, and tossed his stick and net aside. Here, said Insalubrious, what's the idea? This is, said Obelix, knocking him cold with a mighty blow and then draping the net over his huge, prone form. Insalubrious started coming around for the second time. His feeble struggles only entangled him in the net even further. Get me out of here, he spluttered. Coming, coming, said one of his gladiators, trying not to laugh. Roy, let's have a go at you, said Insalubrious furiously, making for Asterix with his sword. But Asterix nimbly ducked and swerved and jumped aside. Now, do you see how annoying it is? asked Obelix. <gasps> growled the trainer making a tremendous lunge at the little warrior, who rushed in at close quarters and sent Insalubrious flying in the air yet again. He landed with another thud, and came round for the third time, to hear Obelix saying admiringly, He really is a great trainer. Very funny, snarled Insalubrious. Very, very funny. All right, I'll get the message. And he stalked off in a huff. But he hasn't finished our training, Obelix protested. I think he's had enough, said one of the gladiators. And now what do we do, said Obelix. It's going to be pretty boring in this arena without any of that nice training. I know what, said Asterix. Everyone come here. The gladiators gathered around him. I know a very good game. I ask questions and you have to answer them without saying yes, no, black or white. Anyone who says yes, no, black or white is out. All right? Ooh, ooh, yes, cried Obelix, clapping his hands. Yes, yes, oh, yes, 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 yes. You're out, said Asterix. No, I'm not, said Obelix. Out again, said Asterix. Tisn't fair, said Obelix. I'm going to sulk. And he went to sulk. Asterix and all the gladiators laughed like anything. Caius Fatuous was startled when his toughest, meanest, heftiest trainer limped into his office groaning. I want my wages in lieu of notice, Insalubrious told him. I'm packing this job in. Those calls of yours are too much for me. I'm going home to make lace in my father's lace factory. That's what I'm going to do. A little later, Caius Fatuous was on his way to the practice arena chuckling to himself. Ho, 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 let's have a look at these amazing recruits for myself. They actually got the terrible insalubrious down, did they? <laughs> he was less than thrilled, however, when he got to the arena, expecting to see tremendous battles going on between the gladiators, and found them sitting around on the sand. What the ages do you think you're all doing? spluttered Fatuous furiously. Playing a game, said Asterisk. That's the idea, isn't it? We're in training for games in the circus. Want to join in? No, bellowed Caius Fatuous. He's out, shouted the gladiator. He's out. I am not, screeched Caius Fatuous, paying you for games like that. You're not paying us at all, another gladiator pointed out. We're all slaves or prisoners of war. We could try another game if you don't like that one, a third man suggested helpfully. How about charades? Get back to your training, snarled Caius Fatuous. Proper training. 
hit each other, hurt each other, knock each other about. I'm off to see Caesar. Why don't we uh, take a little stroll around town too, Obelix? Asterix suggested. Not a bad idea, Obelix agreed. Halt! shouted the guards standing in the gateway. No gladiators allowed out of their quarters. Do put that helmet down, Obelix, said Asterix a minute later. You'll have to drop that silly habit of yours, you know. Why? asked Obelix reasonably. It doesn't hurt anyone. The guard lying in the gateway moaned faintly. I wonder what that crowd's up to, said Asterix, out in the street. They seem to be reading a tablet. Let's go and look. At that very moment, Caius Fatuous was showing Caesar a copy of the identical tablet. Here's the programme for the games, O oh, mighty Caesar, he said unctuously. I've had these slabs put up all over Rome. Hmm, said Caesar, who was not in a very good temper that day. Well, Fatuous, if the people like the games, I shall treat you generously. If not, the lions get the treat. Right, what does your tablet say? Grand Circus Games, it said. Impresario Caius Fatuous. Chariot Races, it said. Gaulish Bard Thrown to the Lions, it promised. Gladiatorial Contests with Asterix and Obelix, the Indomitable Gauls, it finally proclaimed. Booking Office now open. Yes, well, not bad, Caesar grudgingly admitted. You'd better not uh, let those Gauls escape, though. No, they're your star attraction. Oh, don't you worry about that, Caesar, chuckled the gladiator trainer. Here, safely locked away in the circus. And he went off feeling very cheerful, sure that his fortune would be made by the success of these magnificent games. Sure, that is, until he rounded a street corner and heard a familiar voice. Why, said the voice, if it isn't good old fatuous. So it is said another, an equally familiar voice. Well, what a bit of luck. What the Hades, spluttered Fatuous. How, 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 how did you get out? Not a bad programme, said Asterix, critically, studying the tablet on the wall. But we'll be wanting to make a few alterations. I say, old Fatuous does seem surprised to see us, said Obelix. Ever so surprised and pleased. You turned up at just the right moment, said Asterix, taking the gladiator trainer's arm in a friendly way. Recollecting some of the things he'd seen the Gauls do, Fatuous did not much care for that. We were looking for a guide to show us round town, Asterix added. Uh, a, a, a guide? To, to, to show you round town? moaned Fatuous. Then he pulled himself together. Mustn't lose sight of them, he thought. That's the main thing. So gritting his teeth, he took them on a guided tour of Rome. A pity there isn't some way of taking pictures of all this back to Gaul with us, mused Asterix, gazing at the impressive buildings of the Roman Forum. Back to Gaul with you, <laughs> said Caius Fatuous, feeling better when he recollected the fate awaiting all gladiators. You, you seem very sure you'll get out of the circus alive. <laughs> of course, said Asterix, taking Fatuous's arm in that alarming way again. Don't you worry about us. Now, let's go back to your place for dinner. And no boring little pasties this time, suggested Obelix, taking his other arm. Proper bores, right? Dinner was much enjoyed by all. Well, nearly all. Caius Fatuous just reclined there, scarcely able to touch a thing. I'll say one thing for Romans. They know how to entertain, said Asterix finishing a leg of boar. Well, come on, Obelix. If you've had quite enough boars, time to go back to our quarters. At least, Caius Fatuous told himself, hopefully, trying not to beat his head too hard against the wall. At least they'll be laughing the other side of their faces once they get into the arena. There were several days still to go before the games, however, and without insalubrious to keep them fighting fit, the gladiators lounged around putting on weight while the unhappy Caius Fatuous was losing it. There they go again, he moaned to himself as he came down to the practice arena the day before the games. 
playing idiotic parlour games instead of training. Oh, a fine circus this is going to be. Here's a riddle, one of the gladiators was just saying. My first is a hundred. My second is a sign of the zodiac. My third is a Hibernian. My fourth is the Egyptian sun god. And Julius Caesar loves my hole. Who am I? Nobody could guess. So he explained. C. C, they said? No, we don't. I mean the letter C. C for a hundred, he said. C. Leo. Pat. Ra. Cleopatra. You useless lot, exploded Fatuous, striding in. Well, this is your last night in the circus. The games are fixed for tomorrow, and it'll be thumbs down for every man of you if I have my way. With which he marched furiously off again. The gladiators looked at each other in some dismay. Asterix, one of them said. We really don't want to fight any more. We've sort of lost the taste for it. But what can we do? Don't you worry, Asterix told him. I'm going to see you all get safely out of here and home to your families. I promise you won't be risking your lives in the arena. So, much to the surprise of the legionaries on guard, it was a very relaxed group of gladiators who arrived for the performance next day, instead of the usual grim-faced lot. They rolled up laughing, joking, even playing leapfrog. What on earth's the matter with them? one guard asked. No idea, said his companion. Lock them up down below. But Asterix had other ideas about that. Porter, he said to the hefty Roman soldier guarding the cell into which he and Obelix had been locked, we want to see our friend Cacophonix the bard. I'm not a porter, said the guard, and you can't. Oh, very well then. We'll just tear these bars out one by one until you cooperate, Asterix explained. They were very stout and firmly fixed iron bars indeed. Go ahead and try, chuckled the guard. <laughs> Asterix went ahead and tried. Plink went one bar. Plunk went another bar. Plonk went a third bar. Stop it, yelled the guard. Leave the fixtures alone. The service, said Asterix sternly, is absolutely rotten around here. Now, will you take us to the bard? The soldier led them down a dark flight of stairs, muttering crossly, I'm responsible for the fixtures here, I am. Open up, he added, thumping on a sturdy door. Open up, Sender Victorious. It's me, your old mate. Happy and glorious. That's funny, he said after a while. There's no answer. Let me ever go, said Obelix. Oh, do let me ever go. I'm good with doors. He tapped the door gently. It caved in. Ah, mind our door, yelled Cinder Victorious, too late. Then he spotted his friend Appian Glorious sitting on a stool. What's going on around here, he demanded. Why didn't you answer my knock? Pardon, said Appian Glorious, taking a bunch of parsley out of one ear. Love, warbled a familiar voice from inside a heavily barred cell. Love is a many a splendid sea. He's off again, wailed Appy and Glorious, biting his nails. I can't bear it, he sobbed, collapsing into his friend's arms. I, I, I just can't take it any more. Cacophonics, cried Asterix, running to the bars of the cell and peering in. Asterix, Obelix, cried the astonished bard. What brings you here? You, of course, said Asterix. We've come to rescue you. Oh, I'm not afraid of these miserable Romans, said the bard. It's nice to see you, though. Listen, Cacophonix, said Asterix. We promised to get our gladiator friends out of a spot. We'll be leaving for Gaul straight after the games, but not before, right? Fine, agreed the bard. I'd like to see the games myself. I've heard a lot about them since I got here. And just one more thing, added Asterix, making for the door. What? said Cacophonix. Wait till we're upstairs again before you start singing. Philistines! the bard shouted after them. Brutes! Barbarians! And he defiantly struck up once more. Behind them the two Gauls faintly heard him caroling, I'm Roman in the gloom, while his guard burst into fresh sobs. 
By now, a huge crowd was forming outside the Circus Maximus. Salesmen were crying their wares. Wash your togas in Super Persic, shouted a Phoenician from the city of Tar. Super Persic washes even purpler. There were cushions for hire, because the stone seats of the circus were extremely hard, and hot dogs on sale, Latin hot dogs, of course, otherwise known as Kenne's Cowdy. Inside, the great arena was crammed with a huge audience. The citizens of Rome had all come in hopes of seeing the most ferocious and bloodthirsty games ever staged in the circus. Trumpets announced the arrival of Caesar in the imperial box. Everyone clapped the dictator like mad. Everyone, that is, except Caesar's adopted son, who was sitting there half asleep. It too, Brute, said Caesar, prodding him. You too, Brutus. Brutus jumped, went red as a beetroot, and clapped too, while grumbling to himself. I get bored to death of these affairs, he muttered crossly, and one of these days Caesar will get bored to death too if he's not careful. That brute, Brutus, Caesar was thinking. Oh, I can see I'm going to have trouble with him. Both of which remarks were prophetic, as may be seen from an examination of Act Three, Scene One of Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare. Caius Fatuous was sitting in the imperial box too, hoping to goodness that nothing would go wrong with his programme. This is going to be a, a great show, O oh Caesar, he assured the dictator, with more confidence than he felt. I hope so, Caius Fatuous said Caesar. Oh, I hope so, because if not, you'll be in on the act. Let the games begin, he cried, as Fatuous gulped and went green in the face. First to enter the arena were three vast models of wine jars, with men carrying them, and words outside. Drinker, jarer, winer, day, said the jars. They paraded all round the circus before marching out again. I sometimes wonder, mused Caesar, if the public really likes these commercial breaks. Maybe, maybe not, but they pay for the sand in the arena, said Caius Fatuous. But we're coming to the real thing now, O oh Caesar. Just watch this. The chariot races are about to begin. Unfortunately, there was a slight emergency backstage. One of the circus's star drivers was in a bad way, green in the face, limp in the legs, and obviously quite unfit to race. "'What's the matter with him? Why isn't he in his chariot?' demanded the race organiser. "'He's ill,' explained another charioteer. "'He drank a jar of wine before coming.' "'Don't worry,' said a helpful voice. "'We'll lend a hand.' The race organiser gawped. "'The Gauls,' he said. "'What are you doing here?' You should be locked up with the other gladiators. This is strictly against the rules. Oh, come on, be a sport, said Asterix. We wanted to see the games, didn't we? And as you're short of a chariot driver, and we're not on yet, we don't mind stepping into the breach. Into the chariot, you mean, said Obelix. Yes, well, into the chariot too, agreed Asterix. Come on, Obelix. I'll drive, he added, as they stepped into the elegant four-horsepower racing chariot. And you shove off anyone who comes too close, right? Right, said Obelix happily. Oof, what fun. Caesar did not agree, and Caius Fatuous went from green to a nasty shade of yellow when he saw the team of charioteers that now drove into the arena. Two men in a two-wheeler, said Caesar austerely, frowning. That's against all the regulations. I don't much care. Care for such flights of fancy, Caius Fatuous? But it was too late for the unhappy Fatuous to do anything now. Next moment the chariots were off, an awesome spectacle of speed and power. Round and round the arena they went, lap after lap, and team after team dropped out of the race until the field was narrowed down to Asterix and Obelix crammed into their own vehicle, and a huge hunk of a fur-clad barbarian in a chariot drawn by four bay horses just ahead of them. If those two come near me by mercury, I'll get a taste of my whip, swore the barbarian grimly, looking back at the Gauls over his shoulder. They were pressing him close as they turned the bend of the arena and saw a small man staggering under the weight of a huge slab, saying last lap. 
but the driver in front was hogging both lanes. He won't let us overtake, said Asterix indignantly. You just leave him to me, said Obelix happily. Go on ahead, Asterisk. I'm going to have some fun. And next moment he jumped off their own chariot and was clinging to the back of the other drivers. For a moment the barbarian couldn't think what was slowing him down. Then he turned and spotted the huge bulk of Obelix. Let go, he cried. Let go this minute. But meanwhile Asterix had swept past. Yes, let go, Obelix, he called back. Of one. Obelix let go. The barbarian's four horses shot forward uncontrollably. The chariot somersaulted and crunched into the arena barriers. The driver somersaulted too, flew through the air and landed in Caesar's lap. Harvey, Caesar, he croaked, making a manful effort to say the right thing in difficult circumstances. Caesar had some pretty blistering things to say himself, but hearing the spontaneous roar of applause that arose from the crowd in appreciation of the spectacular race they'd just seen, he thought better of it. Um, well, he remarked, well, the people are pleased, and that pleases me. You can go away now, he told the barbarian driver austerely, and um, no more funny business in future, if you please. Uh, yes, that's it, said Caius Fatuous, hastily picking up the hint. Funny business, yes, that's it. See, oh, Caesar, I, um, <coughs> I got up a little uh, comic turn. Um, thought it would please the people. Indeed, said Caesar frostily. The barbarian had been heavy. But we uh, don't want the games to be all comic turns, do we? Oh, Caius Fatuous. No, 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 by no means, certainly not, said the terrified gladiator trainer. Watch this one, O Caesar. We now present a man being eaten alive by wild beasts. <laughs> the people will just love this. And he crossed his fingers, hoping nothing would go wrong with the next act. He was on safer ground here. Cacophonix the Bard could hardly wait to get into the arena. Never before had he had such a huge and attentive audience. Asterix and Obelix were waiting on the sidelines. We'll step in any time you need us, Cacophonix, Asterix assured him. I'm going to take a little magic potion, just in case. Oh, don't worry, Cacophonix said loftily. It's always all right on the night. I've got a touch of stage fright, that's all. Simply my artistic temperament, you know. With which he strolled into the arena. Hi, Julius, he said, spotting the most important person present. Caesar glowered at the bard. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> the Gauls will... The Gauls aren't very polite, you know. Fatuous nervously apologised. Caesar glowered at the gladiator trainer, too. Release the lions, he bellowed. Out they came, roaring. Savage lions from the African deserts, and some ferocious man-eating tigers, too. Several Roman matrons fainted at the mere sight of them. They opened great red jaws, looking about for prey. They're ravenous, O Caesar, said Fatuous proudly. We kept them that way, too. All they've had since we captured them is a yogurt a day. Just watch them tear that gaulish bard limb from limb. He'd reckoned without Cacophonix. This was the bard's finest hour. Striking an artistic attitude in the very middle of the arena, Cacophonix began his latest epic offering. Goodbye to the forum, he warbled. Farewell, Carcassium. The Roman citizens had never heard anything like it. Help, they screeched. Mercy, they yelled. Where's the emergency exit, they desperately asked. Run for your lives, they advised each other. <coughs> Howl the lions and tigers. <coughs> Help! <laughs> and they turned tail and ran for it, mewing pitifully. Shut up, Gaul! shouted Julius Caesar himself. Will you shut up? No, I will not, Cacophonic snapped back. He was a very angry man indeed. I jolly well won't shut up. I will sing, you ignorant lot. I've never had a chance like this before, and I'm going to make the most of it. Come on, all together now, he appealed. For Gaul, 
my son, my dear. Take him away by Juno, Caesar screeched. And at last, a few of the guards were able to shake off the horror of their experience, enough to move in and drag the furiously protesting cacophonics off stage. That left Asterix and Obelix on their own in the arena. They fell about laughing. Up in the Imperial box, Caesar turned to Caius Fatuous. I came, I saw, and I couldn't believe my eyes. Or my ears, either, he frostily remarked. Is the show going on like this? Because if so, I'll eat you myself, assuming the lions and tigers haven't got over their fright. Oh, oh no, 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 Fatuous assured him. The, uh, the, um, serious part's coming next. We now present the gladiators, Caesar. Everything the people like best. Blood and violence, mortal combat, savagery, the lot. I hope so, said Caesar grimly. For your sake, he meaningly added. And in came the gladiators in procession, armed with swords and shields, nets, spears and tridents. Asterix and Obelix joined their ranks. OK, everybody, Asterix reminded them in an undertone. You let me do the talking and I'll fix everything. The Roman citizens roared their applause. Hey, I, Eddie, how they chanted. You'll never fight alone, they sang. The gladiators assembled in front of the imperial box to salute Caesar, according to the custom. Ave Caesar, moriturri te salutant, they shouted in chorus. Hail Caesar, we who are about to die salute you. Hi, Julius, old boy, added Asterix and Obelix, waving and quite ruining the solemnity of the moment. Caius Fatuous covered his eyes. Let the fighting begin before I lose my temper, said Caesar, between gritted teeth. Just a moment, said Asterix, stepping forward. There's a change in the programme, O Caesar. The gladiators now have a new game to show you and the citizens of Rome. We feel sure it will amuse you all. Throw your weapons down, he added, turning to the gladiators. A great pile of swords, spears, shields and tridents was flung into the middle of the arena. That's a great start, I must say, snarled Caesar, looking more thunderous every minute. The gladiators sat down on the sand. Now then, Asterix told the vast audience. This is how we play the game. The gladiator in the middle here asked questions, and the others had to reply without using the words yes, no, black or white. If they do, they're out. You, Thracian, said the gladiator in the middle. What colour is snow? It's light, said the Thracian gladiator. You said white, the gladiator in the middle accused him. No, I did not, said the Thracian. I didn't say white. You did now, crowed the gladiator in the middle, jumping up and down with glee. You've lost, you're out, you're out. All the gladiators roared with laughter. The audience, who had come expecting to see blood and violence, was stunned into silence. Excuse me, said the Thracian, with dignity. I have the right to appeal to Caesar, same as usual in the arena. If it's thumbs up, then I'm still in. If it's thumbs down, naturally I accept Caesar's decision and he marched over to the imperial box, hopefully jerking his own thumb up as a delicate hint to Caesar, who by now was jumping about with fury. Are you trying to make a fool of me by Jupiter? He bellowed at the gladiators. The biggest circus in Rome, 250,000 spectators, Caesar himself among them, and you half-wits think you can sit there playing silly word games? Get fighting, he yelled. You want to see some fighting, Julius? asked Asterix, stepping forward. You shall. Send in some of your best legionaries, and my friend Obelix will help me deal with them. But you just leave these other poor fellows alone. They never asked to come and be gladiators. We did. Ah, so now you two Gauls think you can make fun of me, do you? said Caesar grimly. Very well. You asked for it. Send in a cohort of my crack troops, he ordered. The rest of you, go and play outside. 
Asterix told the gladiators. But was I out or not? asked the Thracian plaintively, as everyone but Asterix and Obelix left the arena. Caesar didn't say either way. The two Gauls got ready to welcome Caesar's legionaries. I'll just finish off the magic potion, said Asterix. Shall we do the helmet routine again? asked Obelix. Do let's, oh, do let's. They waited for the Roman soldiers and waited and waited. Well, are they coming or uh, do we have to fetch them? inquired Asterix, raring to go after draining the last few drops of potion. But just then the sound of footsteps was heard, and in came the legionaries, two by two, marching along, lift, right, lift, right, an apparently endless stream of men, all armed to the teeth. Caesar had other ideas about that. No weapons, he ordered, rubbing his hands gleefully. I want to prolong the pleasure. I want to see you flatten these two Gauls with your bare hands. I protest, said Asterix. It won't be a fair fight if they're unarmed. Obelix, however, had already begun wading into the Romans. You coming? he asked, sending a couple more men flying into the air. And Asterix joined the fray. A whole row of legionaries reeled backwards with the force of the blow he struck the front man. The arena rang to the clash of armour as Romans sailed through the air and fell to the ground, and Obelix busily collected their helmets. Soon he had so many that he had to stack them up in a corner and go back for more, whistling a happy little tune, which gave Cacophonix the bard an idea. He didn't see why he should miss the fun. Striding into the midst of the chaotic scene himself, he informed his friends, I will now give you a song to inspire you with courage. Oh, no, you don't! yelled Asterix, taking a moment off from the Romans to knock Cacophonix unconscious too. Perhaps the audience realised just what they'd been spared. Perhaps they liked the sight of so many Roman legionaries getting thumped. It made a change from the usual circus routine. This was more spectacular than gladiators and wild beasts any day. As the last few Roman soldiers slumped to the ground, they began to clap. They began to shout and cheer. Ave! Long live the Gauls! Encore! Encore! By Jupiter, thought Caesar, the people seem to like it. And I need to keep the people happy. These games are a success after all, though. No thanks to that fatuous fellow fatuous. Gauls! he proclaimed, rising to his feet. You are brave men, and I should know. I declare you the winners, and as you have succeeded in entertaining my people, I will give you anything you ask. Such is the generosity of Caesar. Just as he had calculated, the citizens liked this too. Long live Caesar, they shouted. Ave Caesar, that's what I call a circus, that is. Wake up, Cacophonix, said Asterix, shaking the bard to bring him round. We've rescued you. Look at my helmets, Asterix, said Obelix proudly, pointing to the great heap of hardware in the corner. I won. You never cap that. Hauling the semi-conscious bard after him, Asterix approached the imperial box. Oh, Caesar, I ask you to free this bard, he said, and let us go home to Gaul before we have to beat up any more of your army. And I'd like you to free the gladiators, too. They're not happy in their job. Granted, O oh Gaul, said Caesar. Huh? What? said Brutus, waking up. Is the show over? You really missed something, Caius Fatuous told him. Not a bad programme, eh? he said to Caesar, trying to take the credit. Caesar scowled at him. And I have one last favour to ask, Julius, added Asterix. Lend us Caius Fatuous, the gladiator trainer, for our journey home to Gaul. We'll send him back by return. You can have him and welcome, said Caesar, giving the spluttering trainer a nasty look. What, 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 what are you going to do with me? asked Fatuous, as Asterix marched him out of the arena. They were followed by Obelix and all the happy gladiators, who were waving to the cheering crowd and shouting, Long live Caesar! Long live Caesar, echoed the crowd. Long live the gladiators. Long live the Gauls. What happened to me? asked Cacophonix, coming round at last. 
exactly what will happen again if you dare sing a note before we get back to Gaul, said Asterix grimly. Me sing, said Cacophonix. No fear. I'm not singing for any more Roman barbarians. They don't appreciate me. Economic crisis, the Phoenician merchant, was just getting his galley ready to put out to sea when he saw a little party come down to the quayside. My old friends, the Gauls, he exclaimed. Hi, economic crisis, said Asterix. Will you keep your promise and take us back to Gaul? Of course, come aboard, said the merchant jovially. Business here was very good. I've sold all my cargo and now I'm a stock up again. Um, who's this? he added, seeing Caius Fatuous. A nice surprise for your rowing partners, Asterix told him. And before Fatuous knew it, he was seated amidships at a pair of oars, while all the Phoenician oarsmen lounged around grinning. Do, 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 do I really have to row all the way back to Gaul? All by myself, quavered the Roman. It'll teach you a good lesson. You've been living off other people's muscle too long, Asterix informed him. I know, said Cacophonix helpfully. Why don't I give him a little song to liven him up? No, no, screamed the gladiator trainer. Don't sing anything but that, anything. I'll row, I promise I will, I'll row. And he started rowing like mad, straining every muscle. You know something, said the economic crisis to his partners. I feel we might make this row in a partner too. An excellent notion, Mr Chairman, they all agreed. The voyage home was uneventful, apart from a brief skirmish with the pirates and their new boat. I expect they wondered how we'd been getting on, said Asterix, leaning over the rail to watch the pirate crew strike out for the shore. Well, we have to keep them in the swim. And before long, the Phoenician up in the crow's nest let out a welcome cry. Land ahoy! I see the coast of Gaul ahead! Hip, hip, hooray, by to Tartis, shouted the three Gauls. Thanks for the trip, economic crisis, said Asterix, as they went ashore. And you'll uh, take Caius Fatuous home safe and sound, won't you? Don't sell him on the way. But sell a partner, said economic crisis, shocked. A friend. We're very fond of Caius Fatuous. He keeps us all going. Right, out to sea again, partner, he added as the Roman bent to the oars. Let's speed our enterprise on its way. And as the Phoenician galley put out to pick up another rich cargo, Asterix, Obelix and Cacophonix, happy to be home, walked back to their own village, where the return of the heroes was celebrated with a great feast, with lots of roast boar and much rejoicing. I will now, said Cacophonix, rising to his feet and picking up his lyre, give you all the lay of ancient Rome. But at this the Gauls turned on him with one accord, bound him, gagged him, and Asterix and Obelix, between them, took him halfway up a tree. Sorry, everyone, said Asterix. Carry on feasting. Just a little technical hitch. And he tied another knot to be on the safe side. That's a good gag, said Obelix appreciatively, as they dumped Cacophonix in the branches and climbed down again. I hope so, said Asterix, casting a critical eye up at the furious, but now mercifully silent bard. There are some things, he thoughtfully added, that even a warrior who's been to Rome and spoken man to man with Julius Caesar, not to mention a cohort of legionaries and a dozen or so wild beasts, ought not to be asked to bear. Hear, hear, said Obelix. Pass another bore. <laughs>